and basically um, we've been through uh, I know some of you you know that have been moving forward with TAMS have been uh, at least part way down the path of uh, you know baselining uh, uh, a client accounts establishing their their costs on their plans their their rates their usages um, and then going through and uh, identifying cost savings opportunities by either eliminating lines or consolidating accounts switching plans whatever and um, at that point, then you know, there's this implementation stage, and we have uh, there's like 80 reports now in TAMS that are designed to, you know, uh, facilitate each of the different steps from, you know, all the way from starting with the service agreement through um, the analysis, getting supplier quotes, um, and then the service order changes is where you would actually then submit orders to the uh, to the various vendors, and I want to, uh, we're going to be discussing that today. Um, and then uh, also the savings tracking and reporting. Um, of course, there's an invoicing function in TAMS to take, you know, each month or each quarter, depending on how you want to invoice your clients, um, and accumulate the uh, the savings that have been implemented. And because we track uh, the changes uh, on a per service basis. Uh, most of you that are, have, uh, are far enough down this path uh, realize that you don't have to wait until everything's done to start billing and then only bill for 24 uh, months. You can um, uh, implement some changes, and we all know how the carriers don't get things right, and it may take several months to get a clean bill. You can start billing for the things that have been implemented, and TAMS will track those 24-month cycles independently of the other things that maybe come in later and of course the larger the client the more distributed those changes tend to be over time and of course they could be just basically an ongoing process um, with different locations and, and service types and whatnot um, and TAMS is, is managing each and every discrete change on their own 24-month cycle so um, we're going to talk about uh, how the change order reporting can facilitate um, it's not just a one and done uh, type of, a, of an effort. That would be nice if the world worked that way, but we all know it doesn't. So um, we're going to talk about how to submit change orders that are um, either as broad or as narrow as you need them to be. And then also uh, the reporting and how to uh, invoice a client and track savings. There's um, uh, obviously the invoicing component, but there's also um, other reports that uh, may um, demonstrate to your clients the savings uh, in the that you've accumulated over time and also being able to help you manage what your predicted savings are in the future and uh, do some cash flow analysis uh, to support your businesses. So uh, there's there's a lot of reports here and we have um, I think uh, about 15 of them to get through so um, I'm going to go through them <clears throat> and uh, we'll only have an hour or so it'll only allow for about three three minutes or so per report but I think that the uh, the um, the samples that you're going to see are going to cover everything within the uh, landline arena and then um, there are counterparts to those in the cellular but of course you know the cellular it looks and feels a little different but uh, the, there's a, a, a pretty much a one-to-one -one relationship in these reports between the two sides and if we want to schedule another meeting for for the cellular I'm happy to do that but uh, let's go ahead and start with uh, this um, the service order changes. This is where we're picking up where we've done a, uh, a the analysis. We've come up with some optimizations. We've created a tar, and the client says, "Let's go forward and uh, implement them." So, um, you know, it's it's we break these reports down in a logical order to help instead of just having a list of 80 reports to sift through. You know, they're categorized, and I'm just going to go down through. Um, a client that we have in here called Landline Savings Company um, that we uh, had, they had a, a PRI uh, with um, actually two PRIs. One of them was a full PRI, one was a bonded uh, PRI that had uh, some voice channels and then it also had some internet data on it. They had a ton of remote call forward circuits uh, that were with various providers and uh, the solution was to convert them to a uh, SIP trunk and uh, eliminate, they had more than enough bandwidth, so they didn't need two circuits, they only needed one, so there's some cancellations in here, um, and then c converting our remote call forward uh, numbers to virtual telephone numbers on the SIP trunk, 
So they got converted from you know thirty dollar a month type remote call forwards to um, to SIP virtual telephone numbers. So uh, there was a lot of uh, local savings. There was also uh, some of the remote call forwards were intra lata calls, so there was metered costs for those hops from the remote call forward into the client headquarters. When we ported those numbers into the SIP cloud, those uh, forwarding uh, um, uh, expenses disappeared. So um, anyway, so there was there, that was a, a, a client that um, I felt was a representative for something that we could uh, discuss the implementation. So because of this input, this um, client was uh, set up originally, I'm going to walk you down through um, some of the uh, location history here. We're going to just go to the uh, headquarters and we're going to go into some of these lines. And we started this process with an analysis and all of the, the dates that we had in here were set up for like 1-1 one, one of 2020. We future dated our proposed uh, changes. And then when the changes actually occurred, like here's ones that were converted to virtual telephone numbers, we came in and filtered by uh, using this capability to filter by date. So we put in our future date, which used to be 1-1-2020, one, one, but we um, selected them all, and you notice when you filter by date, you, you'll so get a, a selection of records, and then you can change them by putting in a new effective date and clicking Update Selected Records. So I just wanted to mention that you know there's the the uh, the process is to put in a future date for these uh, proposed changes, but then you can select them en masse. Uh, right now I'm filtering on a single location, but I could select all locations and do these all at once. Um, and change those to um, a, the, the date that they actually occur. Okay, so I'm just giving you a sense though of, of the mechanics for um, changing it from a hypothetical to an actual change. Now, notice that some of these changes that got converted occurred in um, in let's say October of 2013, but there were some other things that occurred uh, Previous to that, uh, like the cancellation of a T1, or, or um, after that, let me, let me find a, um, some, some another example here where we com converted a remote call forward. Those were all in in, uh, in um, October. So we have a, a PRI trunk. Let's see here. I'm gonna find that PRI T1, and uh, that got removed, the second PRI that was not being used, that had some internet on it and 11 voice channels, it got removed in September. So it was one project, but things came in on different billing cycles and it occurred at different timelines. So um, we always uh, want to represent when things actually happen. So even though they all started off on 1-1-2020 as a hypothetical, the reality is they all occurred on different billing cycles, you know, where some of them, you know, there were a, about a three-month window there that things uh, transitioned over. So we could start billing for the removal of this T1, um, you know, beginning in, in September. And uh, let me see here. That one it didn't uh, have a – that was just a, the, a local portion. There's a, some other costs affiliated with this trunk, like this Internet bandwidth was removed. And it used to be – um, had about a $220 plus taxes and local fees. So, you know, we could start billing for some of those changes um, earlier than others, and they each will have their own uh, uh, billable durations associated with them. Okay, so uh, let's take the uh, change report, and um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to take the component of this client that we have set up. Now, this is all looking at a little bit in hindsight. So um, I'll show you the broader picture here in a minute, but I'm just going to do a very narrow. I'm going to select one date, uh, the 17th of July, that I'm going to generate this report on. Now, this client could have been something I did a project for them back in 2012. Well, I don't want all, every change ever done for the client or ever proposed. I only want to pick a time slice for what we have in our history that is going to uh, be at the changes that I want to submit uh, today you know, for, for this client. So I'm picking a single date. I could pick a month or a year or whatever time span is appropriate. And what this uh, particular 
uh, report is gathering is the um, changing the DID numbers from the PRI to um, SIP VTNs. Now, Windstream, uh, which was Paytech, um, they charge a dollar per, on this particular client, they were charging a dollar per virtual telephone number. And uh, this was coming off of these, um, some of these DID numbers that used to be on the PRI. So um, we actually changed the line type in TAMS from what used to be DID, we went in and did a block edit to VTN. And if you're not familiar with that, I'll quickly just show you how you can take uh, a block of items and change them uh, from, v, you know, from one value to another value and update them all at once. So they all used to say DID and we turn, changed them to, to, to uh, VTN. Okay, so what this um, local service change request says it's pre prepared for this client it's with this particular supplier, and I'll show you that if you have multiple suppliers, you can easily export each one of the suppliers to their own Word document or PDF or Excel spreadsheet, and then attach each supplier-based uh, report to a separate invoice to either customer service or the account rep. Because when you submit the change orders, you're sending it to the supplier that you're changing. So even though you may have multiple suppliers involved in a particular project, you can uh, separate this report into uh, one uh, report per supplier. So it's uh, grouped by supplier, and then um, it shows the service address that's being changed that may be important for local services, having the service address. It does echo the pricing parameters of the local plan here, um, and that is, um, done so that if we are given a quote and then we go to implement it and we're let's say we're calling it in over the phone the person that I have that is submitting the change request because that doesn't require a high skill set to submit a change request necessarily um, for something like this they can verify with the person on the other end of the phone at customer service that's making a plan change that the rates are what we expect them to be from what our quote and our analysis was. So it's right here on this report for the purposes of, of allowing you know, a, a person to validate the rates at the time that the order is being placed. Um, it's just another quality checkpoint. Um, rather than having to go off and look. Now, you know, this is a virtual telephone number, so it's not a very, you know, uh, interesting um, uh, pricing, you know, arrangement. But, uh, um, and then there are, you know, this, this list of phone numbers that, and, and there's a total count at the bottom that we, we have 53 lines that we're converting to virtual telephone numbers. Okay, so that is, um, you know, a, 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 a narrow example of converting um, from um, DIDs to VTNs. I'm also going to go ahead and rerun the same report for another n narrower uh, uh, time frame on this particular example. But you know the mechanics of running this are are, are the same, and uh, we're just going to bracket the time line of the changes. We don't want all the changes ever for this client. We just want certain ones. So this is uh, one where we are um, converting and porting um, numbers that are um, with another carrier uh, to Windstream. These are porting remote call forwards in as virtual telephone numbers. So it's a um, Right now, this description is, well, it's a, it's a uh, remote call forward number that forwards to the 6199, and it shows, you know, because we put that into our line description, that we're porting in these numbers, um, but they're not coming in as remote call forwards anymore. They're coming in as virtual telephone. So we're, we're, we're changing the, the type of, of line that they are. But it's the same re looking report, and this request is going to Paytech. Um, so we would say, you know, please, uh, you know, submit to port in these remote call forwards as virtual telephone numbers on the SIP truck. Okay, so um, and then there's gonna, I'm going to show what a cancellation looks like. And so um, again, I, I didn't want to put these all in one report. I just wanted to narrow the request. Um, and uh, we have a uh, an integrated T1 circuit that had voice uh, channels and uh, internet data on it. So one thing that is uh, important, uh, initially, uh, you know, 
these dates, it says on and before 9-1, be attentive to those dates because a lot of people say 9-1 to 9-1, but it's always a but before over here. So you'd say 9-1 to 9-2 to just get the 9-1 uh, records. Um, and it's that's consistent throughout um, uh, Maybe I didn't do it right. Hang on a second. Reports. Landline. Savings 91 to 92. Show. There it is. Okay. So um, this shows a remove from service. It's with Windstream. Okay, and it shows what we have as the uh, well, we have it as a telephone number. Um, actually. Uh, I think the, uh, an improvement to this report would be that it would also show the circuit ID. Um, if I go to this uh, phone number, we actually have the circuit ID in here. Um, so I, I believe that we probably want to incorporate that onto this report. I'm going to make a note of that to, to add that. It's something that uh, I just now noticed. So anyway, but we know we're going to remove that line of service. And it could be lots of POTS lines. Um, you know, whatever you, is removing, but this is all about local service. Okay, now there are other um, services as well, and they have um, a little bit different format because they're different services. So uh, I'm going to show an ancillary, which is also on that integrated uh, T1 circuit, because that circuit has more than just a local uh, component to it. It also has... Um, some uh, other features affiliated to it that are going to be uh, canceled because those savings are going to be part of the solution. And one of them is the internet connection that's part of that T1. And there's also an equipment charge that was being billed every month uh, for that ATRAN, uh, which split the voice out from the data. So those are ancillary features in our system on this account, and we want to make sure that those get canceled as well, not just the local lines, but the uh, internet and any equipment or anything else that's affiliated with it. So um, that is what, you notice it's just a little bit different uh, uh, layout for the report, but it's the same concept. Okay, now this report, like I said, can be exported as an Excel, a PDF, a Word, and that's, you know, everybody should, should feel comfortable with just going to a file and it's clicking export and selecting the, the, the type of file that they want to export it to. So, you know, in our, uh, in our environment, what we would do <coughs> is we would uh, export those and we would go to, uh, let's say, the account um, for this uh, client. And if there's um, a, uh, a, a service order email in here address that we could submit them to or an account rep, we could just click on the account rep, it pops up our email, we drag and drop the reports on here from the PDF or whatever, and we say, please, you know, cancel these devices. And of course, they should know what we're doing because we've already talked to them about, you know, the pricing and so on. So um, it, it is a very efficient, uh, reliable, you don't have to reinvent that wheel from the, whoever did the analysis, you're just taking the analysis that was already done and now implementing it. So I'm going to use a different client to also show some toll reports uh, because this one, you know, it was with Windstream, it was long distance on a PRI, and now it's long distance on a SIP. Um, it's not as, um, as uh, let's say, exciting or uh, convoluted as some scenarios might be. So I wanted to show another example for some toll services using a different client. And we break out the local toll and long distance separately from the toll free and you'll see why in a moment. So I'm going to use a different uh, sample client in here, and on some different dates. It kind of goes back in time a little bit, but it doesn't really matter uh, what the uh, time window is that I put in. Um, for uh, is you know doesn't matter if it's this year or five years ago or next year. Um, this long distance and and uh, local toll. There we go. It shows um, that there is a new supplier that is going to be used, um, what the account number is that they're going to be, um, you know, build on. So this is an existing account. It could be a new account. And of course, if it was a new account, that would just say new there. We don't have an account number yet. Um, what the, uh, it breaks it down by location. So um, 
you can see that we actually have multiple locations on this, and this report moves on down through, you know, like uh, Ohio and North Carolina and so on. Um, if I wanted to just do one location, this is one area I want an example. Uh, let's say I want to do this um, Ohio location. That's the only one we want to change. Even though there's not a magnifying glass on this uh, portion of the report, which a magnifying glass always signifies that there's more detail under the hood and you can drill down and get more detail, even though there's no magnifying glass, you can always take a section like with a box around it and double click on it and you will get a sub report. Notice I have two tabs here now that isolates just that one sub report. It's like a subsection of a document and now I can export just this to Excel or Word or PDF. So if I, even though I can have a big request with lots of changes, I can isolate just a section of it and say that's all I want to implement today. So be aware of that capability across our reporting. That's all, all of the reports have that. Um, and um, the, it all depends on how the report was designed uh, according to the various sections. We tried to make it logical so that you could isolate it by supplier and do a sub-report for each supplier. You can isolate it by account. You can isolate it by location. So those are the various levels. And you can always tell the levels by um, this little navigation tree. Here's a supplier, here's an account, and here's a location. Other reports will be structured somewhat differently perhaps, but you can always isolate a section and, and get a sub-report that isolates just that part. Now, you'll notice that it shows which lines we're picking differently, whether we're picking uh, the L pick and the pick for local toll and long distance, what the pick code should be, are there any LD account codes, which are very uh, antiquated uh, capabilities, but some you know, um, like lawyers and some firms would use a long distance accounting where they'd put in a code every time they made a long distance call. Um, and you can set that in the, um, on the line uh, inventory as to whether they're supposed to have four digit verified account codes or five digit unverified or the various account codes. In this case, we're saying no, there's none. That's the default. Um, it also shows what sub-accounts of this account they're supposed to bill on. So when you have these convoluted like AT&T, uh, OneNet, or AB, ABN accounts, and you have all these different sub-accounts, you can specify, and you're not having to do anything more than what the, the history already had been, that was created for the client to, um, when you did the analysis, you can set up the right sub accounts. Well, now the implementation is just a reporting of the, what was set up by design that, hey, this should be on a sub account called Monroe, Ohio. Sometimes they're like sub account numbers with ABN, you know, 183 or whatever the heck they are. Um, it also shows who is the local provider, oops, who is the local provider, and what is the local account number. Well, even though we're picking them to touch tone, they are. Um, we have to know which local provider has to implement those pick changes. So there's the local provider and account number. So that's necessary in order to get the long distance picked over. Now, I also want you to notice that even though we're going to this one supplier, there may be different pick codes um, and L pick codes. So for example, in this uh, particular location in Ohio, the 5102 carrier, because Touchstone happens to use multiple backbone carriers, um, you can have a plan that says, well, that's like um, WillTel or something like that. Williams Communications is their, their pick code. Well, Touchstone, you can go in and see, well, what their rate is using that carrier in that particular state. And then you can see that, oh, this is a Quest pick code or CenturyLink now, um, which is actually the lower cost carrier. Even though it's going to build through Touchstone, you have a choice of backbone carriers with Touchstone. I don't know if you guys use Touchstone or not. That's a, one of our, you know, um, low cost, reliable providers with electronic billing and no contract commitments or minimum monthly spends. But we can set separate pick codes. Now, how do we do that? Well, it's all done through the uh, plans, and this is a detail we haven't discussed before. Um, but since we're here, we'll go ahead and, and, and quickly just uh, show that um, when we switched over from Global Crossing to Touchstone on this particular account, you'll see that each plan for local toll and long distance 
has what's called the CIC, which is kind of a generic term for the PIC and the LPIC. It's the carrier interchange code. And so that can be set on a plan-by-plan -plan basis, even though Touchtone has what we call a default CIC, a, a 5102, in our notes, we know that Quest is 0432, uh, 5102 is Wiltel, Sprint is 0333, and Broadwing, those are the carriers that they offer through their, their provider. So when we set up the plans, we took the time during the analysis to make sure we specified on each plan what the PIC code is supposed to be. When this order goes over to Touchtone, boom, they know exactly what code to put on each line for each location, what account and sub-account to bill it on, and who the local carrier is that they need to request it from. Now, you'll also notice that, uh, like here is an example where the remote call forwarding circuit that's in place only has a remote call forward that's long distance. It does not, it's, it's a static routing, and it never has local toll calling. It's a remote call forward. So we don't need to change the LPIC code on there. Now, some carriers, you know, in fact, some lines don't even need long distance. So the reporting looks at the history that we have in TAMS. It's all based on that managed service history where we say, hey, we're going to move from this carrier and account to this one. Um, all of this information then stems from that history record and the fact that we bracketed that history in our request for this report. But if we don't have an LPIC, like a local toll on a particular line, then it's going to just say no, no change on that. We're not changing the LPIC code. So um, it's either going to put the new code or it's going to say no, no change. Okay. Um, that should be pretty pretty clear, but it's, I want everyone to be aware of the, the detail and the thoroughness that those reports are intended to, to cover all the bases that are necessary to get a accurately implemented uh, change without, you know, look, does Touchstone mess it up or does AT&T mess it up? Of course they do. You know, they they get things on the wrong sub-accounts all the time, but at least we know where it's supposed to be, and then we can address it in our report. You know, uh, it's not just uh, blind luck. It's deliberate, you know, intent for them to um, to uh, put them on the right account, on the right sub-account, and on the right PIC codes. Okay, so toll free, I got one more change, uh, one more change request for the landline, and that is um, that this shows that we were uh, going to consolidate with the uh, another uh, the long distance with another carrier. It's um, same um, request time window, um, and what we did here with toll free is again we were going from CenturyLink to Touchtone. It's going to go onto this account. Okay, um, and it has the location, it has what the plan is supposed to be, what the rates are, again, verifying the rates with the supplier, um, what the toll-free number is, what the route to is for those toll-free numbers, okay, what the line type is, what the sub target sub-account is with, with uh, and each line, you know, you could have five lines on here, two of them might go to one sub-account, and two of them, or three of them might go to another sub-account, in this case, they're all going to the same sub-account. Okay, there's a line description on there, not really necessary, but I think it's useful when you're looking at it or a, a client looks at this. And it shows who the original supplier is. And notice that there's the uh, new RESPORG and the original RESPORG. Again, those RESPORGs come from the supplier details in TAMS. There's a field for each um, supplier as to what their RESPORG code is. So. The reporting, by virtue of having that history tied to those plans, those plans are automatically tied to suppliers. All this information is put together into this simple report, and it takes a click of a button to do it, and I did no extra work besides my analysis up front. Okay. Any questions about what, what we've covered here? Just, I've got one quick question. Um, when, when you were Doing the TAR, you set the analysis date or the optimization date at 1-1-2020. Do you later yes. come back and change that date? I do once I see the actual change date, and then I do that change, uh, you know, like I demonstrated on the history where we come in and filter like on 1-1-2020, right. and then I'll put in the actual date. Now, I may need to do it by service type or by location if 
things, you know, and I might have to individually deselect or, or you know, because something didn't get done properly, you know. Um, but yes, I'll do that change. So I'll do the change request first off of the one one twenty twenty, and then I will. Um, okay. Uh, later, when I see the billing, I'll come in and change the dates because obviously I need to in order for it to match the you know, to reconcile the bills. Okay, that's what was throwing me off. Is yeah, you were but this is post. This order. is already post right. implementation, and okay. that's why you're seeing these different dates on this demo. Okay. But but the normal would be to start with your like one one twenty twenty or twenty twenty two or whatever you know uh, future date you've you've chosen. Okay. That okay. Now I do want to point out there's another administrative report here called the uh, um, change summary. Okay, and this change summary um, is uh, let's see here which one do I want to use? Um, doesn't really matter. Let's do uh, this one. Seven, seventeen, twenty, thirteen. So sometimes a client is going to say to you. Um, what 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 all did you guys do uh, for us? You know, on this on this what particular project? And I can either show the details or the summary. I'm just going to do the summary, and then I'll show how the drill down works. All the data is there. It's just two different you know levels of of the report. Um, so we can do a. Uh, it's not. This is not intended as to be sent to a carrier. This is intended for your own internal review or to be reviewed with a client. And here's some change summary. Okay, and sometimes it's quite impressive, um, you know, what all was done when they say, geez, you know, I'm spending, sending you a couple thousand dollars a month, and, you know, what do you guys really end up doing for us? Well, we're going to show them, and that's what the retracting reporting is all about. Um, but you'll notice that there's a summary that says six lines had uh, 20 DID block feature deleted. Um, three lines had this directory uh, listing feature uh, moved from one carrier to another. And you can just see this high level, very high level. But if you want to, you can go down into the details and you can see um, for example uh, there were five lines had the local service move from one communications which is now earthling to windstream okay so if i want to drill down on that cost center i can see here there are the lines that had the local service changed and it was the remote call forwarding and this is where we turned them into vtns or whatever so i you know this is um uh it doesn't go into all the pricing and all the plans and everything it's a inner it's just that high-level executive type summary that says, well, here's the lines that we moved from one communication to Windstream. If they want to know, well, how did you move them, we can go and get the details, of course, you know, on, on, on those. But um, anyway, this, um, but it, it, even though this, all of these changes here may, uh, like, yeah, we moved the local, we moved the local toll, we moved the long distance, but it does it service by service. Um, and that's because some lines have services that others don't. So um, anyway. Just be aware that there's this change summary. You can bracket a time window as mu much as you want. You can drill down on individual cost centers. But it, I think that when a client sees this, they're like, geez, you guys did do a lot of work, you know, um, even from a high level. Um, okay, so that's the ad administrative change summary report. Now, savings and tracking. So let's go to um, a client that um, – Obviously, the savings, uh, the most important one in my book, is um, to be able to invoice them for the savings. So what I have is um, we had a bunch of other accounts. Um, they had a, a, a um, consolidated communications. They had a, a one communications. And they're marked as complete and inactive. Once the account's closed, we can mark it inactive in TAMS, you know, just uh, through the um, – little check boxes here about account status and mark their their status to the account. But um, um, when the client is, you know, been optimized, in order to produce savings, we only really have to worry about three accounts. And those are the ones that remain active and this one called deleted services. So uh, as most of you know, the deleted services is a way of tracking uh, items that have been canceled. Uh, and when they got canceled and whether to bill for them or not. So you'll notice that under the billable duration, a lot of these uh, removed services were, um, were uh, and here's a description, you know, DID blocks and things that are no longer billing. Um, but there were a few things that were taken out uh, for various reasons that we didn't bill for. Um, 
and that was a discussion we had with our client. So some things may be billed for and some may not be billed for. Well, in order to bill for the savings, we have to trigger a billing event called a billing cycle on the deleted services account and every other account that it has been optimized. So uh, this is basically considered an optimized account because we deleted some things and it saved them some money. But notice that the deleted services don't cost anything. So adding a billing cycle every month is as simple as um, uh, taking, um, uh, putting in a billing cycle with no usage data and clicking add a billing cycle. And now I, I'm able to bill for another month of savings. And of course, TAMS keeps track of when the 24 months stop automatically. So I could keep adding and adding and adding billing cycles forever, and eventually they're not gonna have any savings affiliated with them. But I don't have to really concern myself with it. I just stop doing this whenever they go to zero savings. Okay, so I have a billing cycle for, for May. I have a billing cycle for May for the other uh, account that is uh, still um, optimized right here, um, and that is uh, a reconciled account. I can come in and calculate my, my cost, and they all turn green. I got my usage in there and everything. That's fine. And I also have um, my master uh, Windstream account that has all of these savings on, and there's a, another May billing cycle. And um, again, when I calculate, I can see that it matches uh, the cost. Now, I want you to notice something, and this is something I'm going to refer back to here in just a few minutes. And that is, I'm off by $2 on my bill um, with this account. So we import the usage, we click Calculate Cost, and boom, that's what we get, 1258 without any, I don't know if we had any billing adjustments on this. Oh, there was a late fee, a $15 late fee. Okay, so aside from that late fee, everything matched. Now, I could reconcile those extra $2 in what odd, some odd sense between these two by just saying apply billing adjustment to reconcile. And what it's going to do is basically put in a, a fudge factor for, for what would be tax differences and stuff of $2.51. Um, but I, I'm going to leave it off of there for now just to show you what happens if you do or don't do that. Okay. So we have three optimized accounts, and all the old accounts, we don't do anything with them. They don't exist anymore. They quit billing back in November or October of 2013. So when, when we're done with that account, we're done with it. But there's still savings affiliated, and some of those may have been optimized, some of them may have been deleted. That's why we, off, we work off of the optimized accounts, including the deleted service, so that it can harken back to the baselines and determine what the savings were, you know, what they used to pay. So how do we, once we've done our audits on our optimized accounts, how do we create the invoice? Really simple. We come in and we click a button. This is like where the rubber meets the road and it's the easiest thing you can do. But all of these other dominoes have to be lined up. So um, there's two formats of this report, and I'm going to show both of them uh, very quickly. Um, so the first one is called My Cost Center. And this uh, invoice does break it down by cost center, and of course the cost centers uh, default to the location name, but you can also put a cost center code or a geo code on each individual line. So um, in this case, um, you know, I think I've defaulted, I have them structured a certain way, but notice that what's nice about this is that it breaks it out for savings on a per cost center basis. So your client's account payable department, when they write a check to you for uh, $968.75, they can see the distribution of that cost for each cost center within their AP system. So that's useful to the client. The other thing is, of course, uh, that they can you can save this as an RPT file, and they can use the re a report viewer, uh, which is a little desktop application that's freely distributable. And they can come in here and say, well, how did you get $982 out of this location? And you can drill down. Of course, it still has the summary at the top here for each. Uh, let's do the whole page. Um, so you can see the savings uh, on a per service type basis. Um, and you can see then line by line where the savings are coming from. So they went from a $26.14 remote call forward to a $1 with tax uh, virtual telephone number. And, of course, if they want even more than that, they can drill down even further. Um, and you can use the navigation tree to get down to, you know, uh, toll services or, you know, uh, toll-free or data services or whatever, and they can get right into the um, nitty-gritty 
uh, details of the usage rates as well uh, by just drilling down further on each individual line. Okay. And it breaks it out. If you have multiple months, it will show for each optimized account. You know, now it's grouped by service type, but then optimized account. And that's important because an optimized account may have a whole bunch of different baselines if you consolidate everything under one account. So um, we group it by the optimized, so you can see the current billing cycle. But remember, they may have come from disparate um, baselines. And when you drill down onto the individual details, I was going to try to um, maybe pick one of these. Let's see. I think this one might. It will show you that the baseline was, oh, this was windstream to windstream. So that was oh, an intra-windstream optimization. But I, I have another location here, that uh, which was this one, communications. You can see that, um, yeah, this one uh, was Windstream, but it's, or its baseline was one communications, and it says baseline local plan. Here's the optimized local plan. And you can see exactly the monthly fee, the taxes. So anybody that is, uh, let's say, a, 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 a pennies and nickels kind of a client, you can give them this report, and with two clicks of the mouse, they can get right down to seeing all the usage, all the price points on any service on any line. So they can look across an entire client with 100 locations or 500 locations and within two mouse clicks get drilled down to all the pennies that they want to see. So uh, that is one format. And what's nice about that format is it does show a side-by-side. -side. Here's the baseline. Here's the optimized. Those are the net costs, including all taxes, and there's the savings. Um, now, there's another version of this report that is um, by account. And this is kind of useful for other for another reason. It's the same data, exact same data. It's just a, the report is formatted somewhat differently. It still has a summary table at the top for the accounts payable folks so that they can key in your costs by cost center. But it then breaks it down into what they used to have for their baseline, and they can drill down onto all the baseline. It's not a side-by-side. -side. You can go actually and see, well, one communications had this account, and they had a DSL and a couple of sub-accounts, and we know those costs are all accurate because it was calibrated very well. Um, and then the optimized shows that, oh, they don't have one communications or consolidated. They just have deleted one Verizon account and one stream. Like here's the Verizon. They used to have two accounts. Now they only have one account. So this kind of gives you a before and after perspective. Same data, it's just two different uh, logical groupings, and they both serve useful purposes. Okay? So that's the invoicing. And, and what happens when you, when you uh, like the invoice, you don't have any issues with it. All you do is you say accept results. Now, it notice down here it says three billing records updated, invoice results saved. That's important because I want to show you what that, what that gives you later on um, by saving the invoice results. There are statistics, uh, parameters on a service type uh, basis that are saved and then that can be reported on later. So I'm going to show you a couple of, of those reports and then we'll be done. So um, I do want to show you uh, some additional reports aside from the invoice. Um, and uh, let's see, one's an administrative type report. There's a couple, actually two of them here. One's called line service history. Um, again, if your client's asking you, hey, what, uh, what do you guys do for us? Um, you can generate what is really a report of in TAMs of all of the changes um, that you actually can see in TAM. So let me go to a, one of these locations here. Um, I'll just do this one. And if I open up the, the a drill down on a single phone number, I can see all of my change history just as if I was in TAMS. So it says, oh, the local started off with this baseline, we've got optimized on this date, and there was you know, uh, a rate change, uh, and then there was another billable optimization. So we did two optimizations, there was a rate change in between, and it can, you can see the account, the supplier, what the plan name was, and so forth. So this is a report that um, basically, instead of looking at it in TAMS, you can put it into a report and send it to a client. Um, so there's nothing new about that. It's just I wanted you to be aware of it. We already I already showed you the uh, administrative 
change summary, and that was the one where it showed, you know, that high-level summary, 91 lines were moved from this carrier to that carrier, or had their local plan changed, or whatever. Okay, now there's some accounting reports that are also pertinent, and uh, one of them is this thing called historical spend profile. Now, here's where that uh, reconciling, re reconciling a billing cycle to the penny is, uh, is pertinent. So here is a uh, actual supplier total on an account, $1,260.86. And as we showed, when we compute the uh, cost based on all tax rates and everything, we come up to within $2.51 of, of that cost. When we run this, and this is described in the help files, but I want you to be aware of it. When you do a historical spend profile, what it does is it um, takes this client, and I'm going to p pick a specific interval of 4 1 2013 to 6 1 2014. Okay. What it does is it shows. This is what they it, – it, it comes up with these numbers by taking not the TAMS computed values, but these actual values of every supplier that there's an invoice in here. Now, if I have an account that I've skipped a month for May, that data point is – and I haven't even put it in here um, in, in TAMS, then, then you're going to have a hole or you're going to see something funky about with your data because you haven't gathered a complete set of records for your client. So obviously – you know, it can only report on the data that it has available to it. But in this case, all of the data for every account is in place. And you'll notice this month it was way down here. And you'd be like, what happened there? But you can notice that over time, here's where their costs were. And then, boom, we got them down here, you know, from 3400 to about 1400 and th And that's real. You know, that's what really happened. So what is this data point? Well, that was the November um, – uh, 11th, and we could actually come down and look at uh, individual months here uh, of individual, and I can actually do a graph of an individual account, okay, and I can see that November of that account had a big negative number. Well, what that was, if we come to that November of 2013, I can click on it and see all of the billable um, credits that were given uh, that we were able to r recoup for this client. So it was uh, some billing errors, and, and we were able to get that taken care of. So um, those were billable credits. So that is coming not from any TAMS calculated values, but from the supplier invoices that are just captured when you enter a billing cycle. So that's pretty powerful to be able to show a client, here's what your uh, actual costs look like over time since we started. Demonstrates your true value. Um, now, there's another report that's similar but different. And that one is uh, what we call the historical cost savings graph. Now, this is the same um, time frame for the same client, and it's going to look really similar in some respects, but it is slightly different. First of all, the um, I don't know, mustard color, I'm colorblind, so I don't know what color they are, but I'm guessing that uh, these numbers, um, these are the optimized. Notice that the, before we did any optimization, the optimized and the baseline are right on top of each other. There's no difference because we hadn't done anything. Okay, but then you start to see the optimizations come in. There's a one big time, one credit that we build for, and then here's where, you know, their costs uh, ended up. Those will be exact with the first chart that you saw if you've reconciled every billing cycle to the penny by putting in that adjustment for, you know, the, the variation in taxes. Okay. But these numbers are based on TAM's calculated values, not the actual values from the supplier. So if you have a well-calibrated, you know, system, they're going to look the same. They're going to be the same. And you can even take out those few pennies if, if, if you need to do that, if maybe you're doing some AP processing, like helping them with their invoice processing. The blue squares shows what they would have paid on their baseline, and of course, that has to be a calculated value. There is no report that comes from the supplier saying, here's what you would have paid. Um, so TAMS is taking those baselines and all the usages and coming up with, and those are actually the gap between those two are what those invoices are for. 
or so we our invoice for for May would be the 3395 uh, versus the 1457 in terms of the savings. So that gap is the billable savings. And again, this uh, so this report uh, gives you that perspective. And for some accounts, you might see the costs go slowly, uh, like flat, or maybe creep up a little bit if their usage goes up, but you also see that baseline, because some people will say, well, you know, we're paying about as much as we used to three years ago when you started with us. How come you're still billing us for savings? Well, here's what you would have been paying without our optimizations. You can see that blue line climb. So that's um, a uh, accounting type report. And I only have two other reports to, to go, and I think we got about five minutes, so we're going to have... Um, just a little bit of time left for some some questions and comments, but um, if I mentioned that one of the things that's also important is um, to be able to manage your own business. It's not just about managing your client's business, but really also to be able to manage your own business and looking at where where are my cliffs in my revenue stream, my cash flow, when are they coming? So we have this. Um, accounting report that's called 12 month savings projections by cost center now this is not just for internal use it's also useful for the client and I'll show you it's like it's like two uh, two great things in one report um, so I'm gonna pick this client I'm gonna start for January 1st of 2015 and what it's going to do is it's going to look forward at the ex expirations of all of the previous optimizations month by month and it's going to also consider any new optimizations that you have in there so Cindy for example if you have a project that you're expecting to be implemented on April 1st of 2015 if that history is set to April 1st and that's going to include more savings this report will see that history record and predict what your revenue increase is going to be when that project gets implemented so you can see either your ending of savings tailing off or the addition of new savings coming on board. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take um, an average of usage, let's say a two-month average of the two most recent billing cycles that are in our system, and I'm going to, because uh, usage will d drive savings, and so rather than, it, you know, um, select uh, an entire year's worth of usage. I'm just going to pick the two most recent months. And, you know, some um, bills are going to have, um, you know, maybe more usage and others are going to have less, but it's going to take an average for us. And it's going to go through and it's going to compute what the savings looks like on a month by month basis for an entire year. And it produces a report. It doesn't take too long, but it did a it did an analysis report 12 times, once for each month. And you can see that based on that average usage, that our savings, we're going to be able to bill. This is the savings fee. So this is the fee, not just the – so it's based on your you know, 50% or 40% or whatever you have. And it's going to say, hey, you can expect 972, 972, 972, 972. Then it's going to drop to 658, 658. Then it's going to drop again. And then it's going to actually get negative because there were a couple of post-optimization price increases where, you know, there's actually a little bit of loss here. But this basically brings us to the end of our engagement with our client. And that's a nice visual to see where, where okay, boy, you know, I better realize that come the end of the summer, I'm going to be down about $800 in, in revenue. And, and only a couple months after that, this client, I'm not going to see that revenue anymore unless, you know, we, we do something. Now, I will tell you a strategy that we use, and that is we can look at this, and my sales guy is going to go in and try to convert them sometime around uh, June or July from our optimization to a managed services. And it's going to come in at a price point that's going to be, let's just, I'm going to pick a number and say it's 500 bucks a month to do, you know, um, ads moves, changes, trouble tickets, whatever. Um, if he comes in and we've been billing him 972, 972, 972, and we say, hey, let's do a managed services agreement and um, it'll only be $500 a month, they're going to perceive that as a price reduction in our, in our services. We're going to continue to gather invoices, look for billing errors, whatever, okay? If we wait until November or October, and then we try to sell them something for $500 a month, they're going to perceive that as a price increase. They're like, well, I'm only paying you $150. You want me to pay you $500 now? You're crazy, right? So timing 
being able to predict this and act on it is is really a key to you know continuing the relationship with a client. Nobody's tricking anybody here, but it, it is a perception uh, management issue that this and and from your own business practice. Now, another you can export this as a table to Excel, and you can do this for each client, and then you could look at all of your revenue projections across your entire company organization uh, on a client by client basis for the next 12 months. And if you want, you can predict next year also. I just picked January of this year as a starting point. But there's a third part to this report that is useful to your clients, and this is their budgeting. Okay, so they come to you and they say, how much are we spending each year for each location, each cost center, or whatever, and by service type, all you have to do is look at these optimized numbers and these columns and say, okay, well, your local for each location is going to be this, and there's the grand total. Your toll is going to be this based on current usage. Here's your data cost. Here's your other cost. So these, and you can drill down and see on any one of these if, if you know, something's happening. I'm only looking at the, really the optimized cost here. We can see January of 2015, and well, let me just show uh, for local, there's February, March, April, so all the details are there for every month. So if, if something's happening, you want to drill down and investigate more, but most of the time, this high-level summary with just the optimized cost is extremely useful for their budgeting needs. So that's, and again, it's exportable to Excel. You can save it as an RPT file and give them the drill down or whatever. So if they want to know, hey, how much are you going to charge us next year? Well, based on our current savings, you're going to pay us $6,600. So with the click of a button, you, you've got a lot of information at your fingertips. And finally, I've got one more uh, item to show you, and that is we have this engagement ending letter where you, when you click on it, it takes all of that saved information from every invoice that you have saved. Uh, every time I said that you create an invoice and you accept it, when you accept it, it um, stores some information which can then be uh, put together to you know Tiger Woods here at Landline Savings Company, and it shows these numbers were populated by TAMS as a merge you know merge letter. So it shows you the percentages on a per service type basis. Over the past 24 months, your telecom costs were cut by this much. Plus, we had this much in uh, billing error refunds. Remember, there were some some uh, billing adjustments that were marked as billable. It's able to you know kind of retain that information on each accepted invoice. And then at the end of this, you know, it can at the end of your engagement. And this is where we can ask them for references or maybe convert them over to a managed services or or whatever. So the information can can flow into you know now it's high level on a per service type basis but um, uh, I think that that is also a, a, you know something we had last year as a nice step forward for us it only works though if you you know have been using um, the teams from the beginning of the engagement um, to have an accurate summary of all the the, the, the accumulated savings so um, that is uh, pretty much it. We, we've hit the end of our hour, but I'm, I'm happy to stay as long as necessary to uh, review anything or answer any questions. Chris, the, uh, the engagement ending letter, can that be run at any time yep. during your contingency cycle? Yes. Okay. And, um, and you can, uh, uh, you know, it stores automatically the date that you generated it so that we know, you know, it's, instead of just a checkbox, we know did we send it and when did we send it. So we use a date instead of a checkbox. But, um, yes, you could absolutely come in here and rerun it at, at, at various points along the engagement, and it will show you what you have accumulated to date. Okay, good. Yeah. That's nice. Yeah. Now, I can also usually pull this information off of my uh, QuickBooks, although I don't break it down by service type in QuickBooks, but my total billable savings should match what I have in QuickBooks versus, uh, you know, because what goes into QuickBooks is, has come out of TAMS, you know. So uh, these the, the consistency between, you know, the uh, fees, you know, I, I, you know, I always expect those to be consistent. Yeah. But it's nice to consolidate that all in one place. That's, yeah. yeah. I like that. 
So um, that uh, kind of covers the implementation, uh, savings tracking, the reporting, uh, the invoicing, um, and it was all landline. But you know, there's the cellular I, again, the counterparts. Um, if you, you know, the cellular um, change orders, they're more cons instead of having them by service type like we do for local, local toll, long distance, and the earth toll free. And you can see that there's a reason why they're they look different on the landline side. For cellular. It's really one report across all cellular services, but we have three different formats. Some carriers like one format over the other. I prefer the very bottom one there, the single row. But other than that, all of those other like historical spend profiles and the invoices and um, you know the uh, 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 budgeting, 12-month projections, th th there's a counterpart in the cellular as there is to the landline. Okay, any, any other questions? Okay, well then we'll finish it up here. I'll uh, 